Welcome back, everyone. We are here to talk about Cyber Patriot today, which is our Air Force's youth program in cyber defense, working on focusing to help educate our young people in a couple of different divisions. So we have both the high school division, which is going to be anyone who's in high school from, from any one of our high schools nationally, both um, public and private. And then they also have a program that is for specifically for our military youth program. So it's called the All Services Division. And they pull from ROTC programs within high schools, but they also pull from the programs like the Naval Sea Cadet Corps. There we are. And we've got our guest joining us today. Um, whoever, not showing up. All right, Chris, if you see this message, go ahead and go down to the bottom of the screen. And you should see a um, two people, people in people picture at the bottom and ask to join um, because you're not coming up as, as the inside of your, oh, let, that might work. There we are. All right, so we're going ahead and adding. So while that's connecting, I'll go ahead and keep uh, explaining. So in the All Services Division, it uses, like I said, Naval Sea Cadet Corps, ROTC program, Civil Air Patrol, as well as Young Marines. Um, so, so all the branches are represented, and then the students compete against their own branch to be accepted to the Nationals program where they compete. So today we have on my husband, who um, is the 2016 National Mentor of the Year. And so uh, I didn't have to go too far to try and convince him to come talk with us. <laughs> this is one of those where I'm well connected. Um, but in fact, he is exactly the person that we would want to be talking to. Um, and so, Chris, uh, we will, well, and I will add one extra thing, which I don't normally do, obviously. And that is to say that, that if, we, if we were to get to the White House, this is in fact the program that we would be championing. championing and, and the area in which uh, Chris would be focusing. So Chris, I've already had a chance to give a little bit of an intro, uh, <laughs> but we'll pass it to you if you can give us a little background on you and your experience and how you got into Cyber Patriot. Okay, so uh, we go back almost 20 years. Uh, my first, what I call my first real day job was working on a help desk for a Fortune 200 energy company on their commodities trading floor. Uh, and I stayed with them uh, a little over eight years and through the course of working for that company uh, started to branch into networking and then I went from there into more of the security side uh, and when I left them I was responsible for IT and the integration of IT and what's called operational technology or OT which is the SCADA side of all their power plants. Uh, they had 30, 34 power plants at that time and so I had functional responsibility and a team of people who were trying to make sure that literally we kept the lights on. Um, <laughs> but following 9-11, uh, some things happened. 2002, uh, after Homeland Security was created, there started to be a push towards securing our national critical infrastructure that in the past had been reserved fairly specifically for the nuclear power segment uh, because of the concerns about what could go wrong there. And so uh, there was an organization created called NERC uh, under the Department of Energy and NERC put out their critical infrastructure protection guidelines. And that drew me squarely into security and compliance uh, in this critical infrastructure space. So I went from there uh, to another company where I helped run their threat and vulnerability management practice for a few years. And then on to a large engineering firm that builds critical infrastructure and we were focused on security risk and compliance and resiliency for uh, energy, water, wastewater, oil, gas, and mining, connected cities infrastructure, what you're seeing a lot in the news today. Um, all of this stuff that everybody calls IoT has existed for 20, 25, 30, in some cases longer years uh, in a world that we always called industrial controls or IoT or OT, excuse me, or SCADA. SCADA is an acronym, stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. So anytime a computer makes a physical system perform a function, opening a valve, your garage door, uh, if you have a smart thermostat in your home, uh, a circuit breaker, these systems have existed and exist in a lot of different places. Uh, they were designed 
to be resilient. They were not designed to be secure. And so we've had to push to try to get uh, the industries that utilize them to focus more on this. So uh, when, when I was at the engineering firm, uh, my stepdaughter Monica took an interest in the Navy. And she joined our local sea cadets unit. We can and say our had, daughter, I think. <laughs> yes, yes, our daughter, yes. And she... A little awkward. <laughs> she... Um, she pushed into Sea Cadets and she voiced an interest in their Cyber Patriot team. They had a budding young Cyber Patriot team that had been functional for a portion of a year. And Cyber Patriot program has coaches and mentors. And the coaches are people that handle uh, the logistics, the organization, the team, keeping everything on track or revising the practices. Sometimes those people have technical skills and sometimes they don't. And then the teams search out, and there's an actual searchable database for them, mentors. And mentors are people who have been practitioners in the industry, uh, like I had been. And so I joined their team as a mentor. And that first year, uh, there were about 1,800 teams competing. Each team is five or six kids. Uh, and we ended up making it to the national finals, which put us in the top 30 teams in the country. And we ended up placing seventh. And so then following two years after that, that next year we missed national finals by a, couple of, uh, by a couple of points. That next year we ended up going back to national finals and lo and behold, we managed to win the all service division. So that put us, uh, that year there were 3,500 teams roughly in competition, uh, roughly half of those in the all service division. So that put us at the top of that barrel. And uh, I'll show you, I'm actually wearing my Cyber Patriot uh, mentor lapel pin, which I Oh, very nice. And uh, to, to represent the organization. So this really is, in my mind, the best answer that we have to cyber readiness and preparedness, both for our government and our military, but also in the civilian sector, because students come out of Cyber Patriot with a fairly strong understanding of what it means to secure a system and a network and they learn a little bit about computer forensics and then that prepares them potentially for a career path if they're so interested um, and we need people i've mapped out as i've seen it probably about 45 career paths into cybersecurity, and they're not all technical they're not all people that want to write code they're not all people that are doing network security or being hopefully good white hat hackers we call them uh, penetration testers, application testers. There's also people that work in the social engineering side. There's people who function in roles where they're communicating and helping uh, the leaders uh, or a public or government organization understand why we need the technology. Because not everybody's going to get the tech themselves. So we need those translators. And that's you know, we, it, it, being a mentor in this program allows you to be able to interact directly with these kids and help them understand that there's a lot of different paths that they could take and that there's some real value for our national readiness in what we're doing. So let's back up a little bit. Let's start with why we have the program, right? So when we look at China, when did, when did they start training in this area? Sorry, I lost you there for a second. It paused on me. I didn't hear it. That's all right. When, when did China start uh, educating their young people in this area? So as best we can tell, the Lanshan Vocational School has existed since 1984. And that I'm school takes roughly 30,000 kids a year, uh, puts them straight from elementary, middle school, high school, entirely cyber focused into a college program, which then feeds out into the Chinese army. By comparison, we started our Cyber Patriot program when? Cyber Patriot is six months older than U.S. Cyber Command. They were both started in 2009. 2009. They started in 1982. They put 84. through 84. And mm -hmm. they put through 30,000 students a year. And we mm -hmm. put through how many? We're roughly equal to that now. Cyber Patriot, last time I checked, was roughly about uh, between five and 6,000 teams, which approximates between 25 and 30,000 students, depending. Okay, so we're, so we're catching up, but we are behind on the historical side of things. Uh, Definitely. Which means, sure. And so what that translates to, uh, because I think, you know, people watching may assume, well, if we've caught up that now we're uh, on par, but really <laughs> it means culturally and historically 
all their parents were trained where, where many of us or those 10, 15 years older than us were not. So right. the entire society understands it better than we do. Right. Um, so one of the things that, that has come up a few times, and, and obviously you and I have talked about it offline, but that is that the, when we get into cyber warfare, people are starting to work, well, the adversarial nations are working around military because military in some cases can be much, very difficult to get through, but going to civilians may be quite easy. So how does a program like this help even for those who are not gonna go on to be cyber professionals? How does it help them to really proliferate the understanding of cyber defense and the necessity of all our citizens to be educated? It comes down to awareness. So yeah. people need to understand that we are part of Part of a greater collective. Everyone who uses the internet in one way or another is interconnected. Uh, nobody, nobody ever, ever can tell me, and I do some public speaking engagements, I always ask the same question. Nobody ever can tell me the name of the air conditioning company, the vendor, that, that got Target breached. Everybody knows that Target got breached. Nobody knows the name of the HVAC vendor. Yeah. The actions that you take in a connected space of consequences. And I always Wait, so explain relate that to, one. Ex explain well, that because most people I'm don't gonna, know what happened. I'm going to get there. I'm going to yeah. get there. So I relate this to my concept uh, that I use a concept that, that you use as well. And that's the ecosystem. Right. If you are the system owner, if you are uh, the target corporation of the world, you are responsible for your ecosystem. For them, that's their stores. It's their people. It's the point of sale systems, the cash registers. It's the website. It is all their interconnected systems. Well, in their case, their interconnected systems included the HVAC, the heating and air conditioning systems in their stores and in their distribution centers. And in order to maintain those, Target is not an expert in HVAC, so they hired a third party company. And big commercial air conditioning systems like that often have control systems that are interconnected. So the vendor had the ability to remotely access and monitor these heating and air conditioning systems to make sure that they maintain stability and all these sorts of things. And uh, that company was breached. And they could be, uh, I didn't dig into all of the details on it. I don't know that one off the top of my head all that well. But typically what happens is you have someone working for the company that receives a targeted email. They click on something in the email. It loads malware onto their computer. They are then able to use that. Uh, the hackers are smart about this and they'll wait and they'll watch and they learn and they figure out where they can do something called pivoting. And they will pivot and they'll worm their way deeper into those systems until they can get cross connectivity into, in this case, targets HVAC system. From there, they waited over a period of almost six months and they slowly and steadily made their way deeper and deeper into targets environment until they managed to reach the point of sale system, uh, the cash registers that are processing credit card transactions. And from there, they had the keys to the kingdom. From there, they were able to exfiltrate all that data uh, and steal the identity data because not, not only Target is one of those uh, companies that, that can take credit cards, but they also take uh, debit cards. You can do a variety of e-check transactions with them, PayPal and other things on their website. So it gathers more than just your credit card information. You get a lot of other personal data. So when you have a situation like that, uh, these adversaries will very specifically dig in and figure out what they can take and what value it has. Right. And that's where uh, large companies have come to rely on people that have education and training in this space, like I do in my firm, uh, to try to make sure that that doesn't happen, both by watching in real time, but also by making sure they understand the risks of the vendor partners that they choose. And that's been a big topic of discussion. The, uh, the NERC SIP world, the energy sector is actually in the process of passing new standards around supply chain risk. And I am the co-chair of the, co-vice chair of the supply chain working group under NERC SIP. And we're talking a lot about this, how the big energy companies, part of the bulk electric system are gonna make their decisions around what vendors have access and which ones don't and how it gets secured. So thinking about this from a pipeline perspective, going back to Cyber Patriot, if if somebody wants to get involved, how do they help their child do that? Uh, the first thing is just by starting the discussion. So anybody can go to uscyberpatriot.org and look for a team. Uh, there may be a team at a local school. 
If not, there are also the all-service division teams include Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps Junior ROTC, but also extracurricular programs, Civil Air Patrol, and Sea Cadets. So if one of those programs is viable and it's something they're interested in, they can approach it that way. But they also can approach uh, a teacher or an administrator at their local school and say, we don't have this, I'm interested in this. And if the parent in particular is willing to volunteer some time, they might make a good coach. Because as I mentioned, the coach's job is a logistics function. Then you have to find your mentor. Sometimes you can find that in a computer teacher in a school, but you also have the online database that's provided by the Air Force Association who runs this program. Um, and by the way, that the pathway here is Cyber Patriot actually has published a book for preschool kids, uh, which I took a copy to Maddie's school and we read to her class last year uh, as first graders. Uh, uh, Sarah the Cyber Hero, it's called. And then they have started the program in elementary school, goes on to middle school and high school. The back end of Cyber Patriot, the competition system is run by the University of Texas San Antonio, and they also run the back end of CCDC, which is the college version. So this bleeds right into college, and the colleges are actively recruiting some of these high school kids. Uh, not to mention the fact that the championship teams, the top three teams each year, including our team, uh, really receive a little bit of college scholarship money uh, right. for, for that victory. Speaking of which, we need to make sure Monica gets hers. <laughs> I, it's been three years. I, I totally forgot yeah. about it, but she could use yeah. it this year. She um, gets a little I bit of money. That's correct. That, yes, yeah, she, she does. I believe it was $2,000 that she gets, which would be yeah. a really nice boost for her. So um, yeah. we're, we're taking our daughter to school next. No, I'm going to Sunday. It's Monday. Two days. Yeah, Sunday, Monday. Yeah, I go. I go is... Yeah, I go in two days. My schedule is so crazy. I can't remember what state I'm in most of the time, but yeah, I fly out Sunday. So um, she'll yeah. be, she'll be arriving and then we move into the dorm on Monday. So definitely exciting, but I, I don't know how. And they have a competitive CCDC team there. So we'll yes. see if she yeah. uh, goes down that path and uh, see where it takes her. Yes. You know, yes. we talk about pipeline. It's worth pointing out that uh, through the course of the, the kids that I have mentored, there's a real opportunity to empower them to join the cyber workforce. So right. uh, three of our teammates are working with me uh, at Direct Defense, and we have other opportunities to be able to offer potential uh, internships and things like that. And I really, I, I would offer up to anyone who has background in the space who's considering being a mentor that in addition to giving back, uh, so I never served in the military, but to me, I, this is how I give back to our national readiness and national defense is the yeah. time I spend. The mentors on competitive teams, we probably spend about 300 hours a year working with the teams to prepare them for competition. And, uh, you know, part of the give back is, is just the feel good, but part of the give back is it allows us to have a pipeline of potential people who are going to be talented in the space. You know, we yeah. have we have two million empty cyber jobs in this country right now of a whole variety of skill levels. And this is probably our best mechanism uh, that we're going to have to try to fill that gap. Yeah, and I think a lot of people don't realize how exciting these competitions can be. So <laughs> as a mom, you know, we, we grow up going to sports and our daughter who, who was in Cyber Patriot was also a lacrosse player. And, and so you're used to this competition, you're used to this back and forth. And actually she did an interview where they asked her about the comparison of cyber to sports. She said, it's almost exactly the same. And I can tell you as a mom, when you're watching the scoreboard and, the, and it's interesting because they, in sports they show it's this team against that team and you know who's leading, but in cyber they don't. It's updated in real time. It can go four to six hours in some cases, uh, but you don't always know which team is which except you can start to tell which team realizes their computer was just crashed or compromised or, or something. And so you, you get a hunch of it, but it was Sometimes to me. Sometimes one of your kids deletes yeah. their operating system. Uh. Right, right, right. It was as exciting as watching something on ESPN. So it was, it, it, it to me is one of those uh, nerd competitions that I hope we really see. So I'll finish with this, Chris. If we achieve the, the impossible, as we like to joke in our team, and we get to the White House and, and you have this opportunity to go out and do something really tremendous for the country. 
in short, how would you take a program like this and expand it? What is it that you would want to see happen? Pie in the sky. How, how would you help with national readiness with Cyber Patriot? I would love to see a national cyber curriculum included in all schools across the country. Yep. Uh, if, even if it's only just one class, something that's an introduction that can get people an understanding that you don't have to just be a computer programmer to go into computer security, that there's all these different fields, there's all these different necessary skill sets. And we have a lot of open jobs that pay very, very well. And our reliance <laughs> on technology is only going to increase so the value of that of those skill sets are only going to continue to expand uh, and really i think that's what i would do with it you know the air force association uh, you know i've had the opportunity to interact with their leadership they've done a really fantastic job uh, really i'll have. give a shout out uh, the northrop grumman foundation is the principal sponsor they give a couple million dollars every year into the program microsoft and cisco all the training that's available to these kids is available free to them and they're getting training that working professionals in my industry pay anywhere from three to $5,000 per week to get. So uh, it, there, it really is a fantastic opportunity to expand uh, into something even bigger. Hopefully I'm not giving the AFA folks a, a heart attack over uh, <laughs> trying to be able to support that, that type of infrastructure, but um, they've well, done a good it's job. A big compliment. Yeah. Sure. Oh, they've done no, a, absolutely. Yeah. I think very highly of the program and anybody who interacts with me knows that I talk about it a lot. Yeah. So. Well, and I like your, your point of how do we complement it from a government perspective, right? So how do we get it into the right. schools so that we are making that easy? Not that the mm -hmm. schools have to create a whole new curriculum or figure it all out, but how do no. we make sure that our state systems have access to the information and that we are turning kids onto it? And also uh, having leadership in government who is talking about this and getting kids excited about it and who has a background in it the cultural impact of that could be amazing. Absolutely. You know, we really have tried, at least my efforts have been uh, around trying to get people interested. And I, we want to create evangelists for cybersecurity and for Cyber Patriot and the national readiness and awareness. Uh, one of the advantages that Cyber Patriot has is that it is already a fully distributed learning system, which I know right. has been a, a big topic for you. Uh, yes. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's already built that way. And so that's a huge advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for, I, so wait, where are you right now? Because like, you're am, not at home, right? <laughs> no, I'm in Colorado. You're in Colorado and I'm in South Dakota. I think I'm mm -hmm. finally in South Dakota. I'm trying to figure yeah. out if I've crossed the border yet. <laughs> so what's interesting today is I attended the promotion ceremony of an old friend uh, he, he spoke highly of my of me and my skills in his promotion ceremony, which was oh, um, wow, unexpected so and it was very yeah. nice. But uh, he is one of the first Army cyber colonels ever minted because U.S. Yeah. Army Cyber Command stood up 2015, 2016. So that's right. what happened. 2009 was was U.S. Cyber Command. But then the yes. service branches followed on in a stair step. Uh, Marine Corps Mar4 Cyber was only stood up in 2017. Yeah, I was going to say that's, a lot, that's the most recent is Mar4 Cyber. Right. Yeah. So yeah. the three star general that promoted uh, uh, my friend the colonel today, he said that uh, he's one of the very few officers that he's aware of that is wearing the cyber badge on his uniform. Yeah. He's only seen a handful. Well, I can't emphasize it. I mean, and you and I talk about it all the time, how important this is going to be going forward. And it is not a topic that we're hearing very much in politics. Uh, and it, it, it shouldn't be from a political perspective, meaning it shouldn't be a, a Democrat, Republican kind of issue. This is a national readiness issue. But it needs to be in politics because it deals with government and it deals with talent management and it deals with the pipeline like you're talking about, making sure that we have our youth programs, making sure that we are tying that mm -hmm. to the school system, making sure that we are helping people be aware of the jobs that are available, and then making sure that we both get people into military, but like you, making sure that we have individuals that are able to have external civilian jobs and then work with the military to ensure that we are all working together for this, this readiness and defense perspective. So it's, right. it's understanding that entire pipeline and that information, we're not hearing it anywhere. Right, and part of the problem there, you speak to the challenge. 
uh, the private sector, when there's 2 million open jobs, they're fighting over talented people. They're paying top dollar yes. for them. The government yes. pay scale doesn't support that. So no. we need a mechanism where people can provide service to the country uh, without yes. having it needed to be their full-time position, or they're going to have to make some accommodations in the GSA schedule and so forth to account for the necessity of trying to compete with the private sector. Uh, the other side of that is um, better and easier mechanisms for people like me who didn't serve in the military to be able to participate. Uh, I did take part right. in the Army's Cyber Shield exercise in 2017. Yep. Uh, that's the Combined Army and Air Guard uh, cybersecurity event. It's a week-long thing that they do, and they do invite civilians into that. So I took part in that. But it's those types of things where we can uh, give back. And if there was a, an easier mechanism to be involved in, whether it's the guard or the reserves or even active duty on a, on like a part-time basis, I, I know a number of practitioners with, with my type of experience who would be interested. And, and, and that's the secret sauce, right? How do we do it in government, which we do know we can do and we can create the part-time billets. That's not even challenging if you know the government system. Uh, and then we have people that are readily available. And so it's really just knowing this pipeline, knowing how to make it work and then executing. So, well, thank you. And I'm glad we were able to, <laughs> this is one of the most unusual ways we ever get to connect. Um, although yes. for those who don't know us personally, we are very used to being um, asynchronous and distributed. We always call ourselves the distributed family. So uh, we frequently have, we have three children that we chase and even they are oftentimes in different in different cities or different states, and um, and then Chris and I are often in different states, and we don't even always keep track of each other's schedules. Yeah, <laughs> it's just yeah, too I'm hard. sitting, I'm sitting in a rental car on Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado Springs, Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be in Colorado, I think, in two weeks. I won't. So I will. I will just miss <laughs> you. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, we will catch up again soon. Thank you to everyone for joining us. And I hope I hope you look up Cyber Patriot and I hope you take very seriously the absolute necessity for this to be a hallmark and, and pointed point that we need to be thinking about in this country. Um, and we are just not having enough conversations on it. So uh, I, I don't know if I could put more emphasis on it, but but definitely I can tell you from our family, this is something that we are really passionate about. And uh, that if we get into an office space, this is this is an area we'll take very serious, seriously, and you'll see a lot of changes <laughs> immediately. All right, Chris. For I all you retirees out there, there's a lot of uh, logistical support needed for these teams locally. So yes. if you've got yes. time to volunteer, this is a good cause. It's uscyberpatriot.org. Well, thank you for that. Love you. I will see you later. Love you too. Bye. Bye.